Hello and welcome to today's Energy Tech University webinar, Generator Degassing and Purging, Best Practices for Safe Plant Operation, sponsored and presented by Environment One Corporation. Catastrophic events have reinforced the critical importance of safety and risk mitigation strategies in power plants worldwide. This webinar discusses the challenges that today's operators face including the reduction of well-trained plant personnel and planning for emergencies. This webinar will give you a preview of what you could expect to learn about in the upcoming Generator Auxiliary Systems Symposium slated for July 30th to August 1st in Saratoga Springs, New York. This event will be co-hosted by our Environment One and Energy Tech Magazine. We'll provide more information about the symposium at the end of this presentation and in a follow-up email. My name is Kathy Regan, editor of Energy Tech Magazine. I'll be your moderator for this webinar. Our presenter today is Gus Graham of E1. Gus is the Director of Plant of Product, Products and Markets, Africa, Asia, for E1's utility systems build, business. In his previous role, Gus was the Director of Engineering for E1's Utility Systems business, where he led product support and new product development. Prior to joining E1, Gus worked for Plug Power, where he directed systems engineering, product verification, and engineering field support. Gus has over 20 years of experience in the power industry and has authored several technical papers for E1 and holds three patents on controlled optimization of reformer-based hydrogen fuel cell systems. Our one-hour session today will be recorded on video, so if you want a refresher later, you will have access to that recording. The instructor handouts are downloadable from the handout section of the GoToWebinar control panel located on your right. Our session today will last one hour, you are encouraged to ask questions during our session. By default, everyone is muted, so in order to ask a question, you will need to type your question into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we will be asking those questions at the end of the presentation. So at this time, I'm going to turn things over to Gus, and we will let him begin. Thank you, Kathy. Generator degassing and purging is a critical process for plant operators of hydrogen cooled generators. Today's webinar will discuss the best practices for safe plant operation and discuss the critical requirements for consideration when automating this process. During this webinar, we will cover why we use hydrogen as a cooling gas. We will discuss safety concerns with working with hydrogen. We will discuss the components of a hydrogen auxiliary system. We'll review best practices for safe plant operation and walk through a purging process. And in closing, we'll cover requirements and considerations for automating a purging process. Before I start, I'd like to review some terms I'll be using in today's webinar. The terms rapid and emergency are sometimes used interchangeably to describe the speed of a generator purge process. The terms purge, degas, and fill I'll use interchangeably when referring to that process. When discussing the generator purge process, it's important to note the difference between degas and depressurization. Degassing or purging is replacing one gas in the generator with another, while depressurization is reducing the generator case pressure. The term OEM stands for Original Equipment Manufacturer. When we're talking about the generators during today's presentation, be thinking of folks such as General Electric, Siemens, Hitachi, and so on. And the term SOP stands for Standard Operating Procedure. So why do we use hydrogen as a cooling gas in the first place? In the late 1930s, increasing demand 
for larger generators required alternate cooling methods to be developed. These larger generators required more efficient cooling methods, and the engineers required a low-density gas with good cooling properties. Initially, they chose helium as the gas. Due to scarce supply and the high cost of helium, hydrogen became the gas of choice. However, hydrogen does present some challenges. Less windage, frictional losses, hydrogen is compared to air. At generator operating pressures, the relative density of hydrogen is approximately four times less than air. Hydrogen has better heat transfer characteristics than air. Hydrogen is 14 times more efficient at removing heat than air. That is to say, one pound of hydrogen will remove 14 times more heat from an environment than one pound of air. These properties allow the OEMs to produce more megawatts per pound of iron. And currently, there are over 10,000 hydrogen cooled generators operating worldwide. Now we'll talk about the challenges presented by hydrogen gas. Hydrogen is a highly flammable gas with flammable limits in air ranging from 4% to 76%. This makes hydrogen with the widest range of flammable limits in air. Hydrogen is also colorless, odorless, and tasteless, which makes it difficult to detect by normal means. Hydrogen is difficult to contain due to the very small molecular size. And hydrogen also presents material compatibility concerns when you're designing materials to work in a hydrogen environment. Most people are familiar with the elements necessary for fire as represented by the fire triangle on the, on the screen. Air in the presence of fuel and ignition source at the right mixture will result in fire or an explosion. Today we'll present a safety triangle in your plant that comprises the correct equipment, the correct processes, and well-trained people to provide safe operating conditions in your power station. This is a headline from a local newspaper. For privacy reasons, I've removed the name of the power plant. The incident in question occurred during the generator purging process. This is a photograph of the plant shortly after the event. The explosion happened as a result of not knowing what gas was in the generator and thus not taking the appropriate safety precautions with hydrogen gas present. Now let's review the generator hydrogen auxiliary system. This is a section view of a hydrogen cooled generator where the yellow lines represent the flow of hydrogen. The rotor fan circulates the hydrogen through the stator and rotor and across the hydrogen cooler, which is represented by the shell and tube heat exchanger here. The red circles denote the hydrogen seals between the generator case and the rotating field. Proper operation of these seals is critical not only during normal operation, but also during purging of the generator. This is a close-up section view of a hydrogen seal. Highlighted in the circles, you'll note that the seal oil pressure is being controlled at approximately five PSI greater than the hydrogen pressure. This pressure differential is key for proper seal operation, and as we'll discuss later on, becomes a consideration for proper generator purge operation and during your automation, if that is being implemented.
This is a typical hydrogen auxiliary system PNID. This circle on the right represents the equipment associated with the generator gas manifold. And also the generator gas manifold's purpose is to put gas into the generator and take gas out of the generator and maintain generator hydrogen pressure during normal operation. The circle on the left is denoting the generator gas analyzer, also known as the hydrogen purity analyzer, as well as associated hydrogen pressure monitoring and instrumentation. This is a picture of a hydrogen auxiliary skid, which depicts the components that were identified in the PNID that we discussed on the prior slide. The generator gas analyzer and associated pressure monitoring equipment is denoted by the circle on the right, while the circle on the left is identifying the key components of the generator gas manifold. So first, let's discuss the CO2 supply system. Back on our hydrogen auxiliary system PNID, the circle here denotes the bulkhead connection where the CO2 supply is connected to the generator gas manifold. Within the generator gas manifold, we have monitoring of the critical supply pressure with a local gauge and pressure transmitter. The CO2 supply pressure equipment is identified here by this circle where we have the local gauge, the transmitter is mounted on the back side of the panel, and we have isolation valves and calibration ports present. In some instances, this equipment may be mounted on pipe work somewhere between the CO2 supply and the generator gas manifold. This is a picture of a CO2 tank farm. Typical arrangement of several gas bottles manifolded together. The CO2 bottles contain liquid CO2, which vaporizes to gas as it's admitted into the generator. This particular manifold includes local pressure regulation and local pressure monitoring, in addition to the manifolding of the CO2 bottles. Next, we'll review the hydrogen supply. On our hydrogen auxiliary system PNID, the bulkhead connection for hydrogen supply is indicated here. The hydrogen would be supplied through the series of valves, check valves, and admitted to the hydrogen header in the generator. In the generator gas manifold, we're including hydrogen supply pressure monitoring. Similar to the CO2, we have a local pressure gauge and a pressure transmitter to transmit the signal to the control system. The hydrogen supply pressure monitoring equipment is also located near the CO2 supply pressure monitoring. Local gauge, isolation valves, calibration ports. And as with the CO2 supply pressure monitoring, in many instances this equipment is mounted on pipe work somewhere between your hydrogen supply system and your generator gas manifold. This is a picture of a hydrogen tank farm. This example includes palletized systems where several hydrogen bottles are manifolded together to create a pallet and then the pallets are daisy chained together to feed the hydrogen into the plant. An alternative arrangement would be to have bulk tube trailers, one or several of them in a pad configuration tying the hydrogen into the plant header.
The hydrogen can also be supplied from an on-site hydrogen generator, which utilizes electrolysis to produce the hydrogen. A device similar to that is shown in this picture here. The final feed gas that we'll discuss is air. Your air supply is typically provided by a plant compressed air system that connects into the generator gas manifold at this header connection here on our hydrogen auxiliary system PNID. Of critical note, we have a, a removable spool piece which is used in the gas manifold to minimize the chance of hydrogen and air being put in the generator at the same time. We'll stress the word minimize because even though a spool piece is utilized, it is still possible for hydrogen and air to be admitted to the generator at the same time. This is a picture of a spool piece associated with the PNID example we've been using. Some designs employ multiple removable spool pieces, one for each gas being introduced into the generator. You'd have one for hydrogen, one for air, and one for CO2. And in these designs, mechanically they're designed such that only one spool piece could be installed at a given time. Again, these devices are intended to minimize the possibility of air and hydrogen being admitted to the generator at the same time. Again, back to our hydrogen auxiliary PNID, the balance of the equipment represented by the circle here is our generator gas analyzer and associated hydrogen pressure monitoring instrumentation. In addition to the generator gas analyzer, this system included generator fan differential pressure monitoring with local gauge and differential pressure transmitter, as well as local case pressure gauge and case pressure transmitter. This picture again denotes the location of that equipment on the hydrogen auxiliary skid. The local gauges, the analyzer display panel, the isolation valves for controlling the modes of operation of the analyzer, and the flow meters for controlling the amount of hydrogen flow passing through the analyzers. During normal operation, the generator gas analyzer is connected to the generator fan suction connection and the generator fan pressure connection. The rotor fan differential pressure will create a flow of hydrogen gas through the analyzer to ensure constant monitoring of the generator gas purity. In this image here, you'll see the connections that are on the generator. Typically, the generator fan pressure and generator fan suction taps are on either end of the generator near the end shield. Some generators have a dual rotor fan situation, so the taps could be on either end. It's important to note that the taps are located just prior to and just after the rotor fan blades to generate the most flow through the analyzer. The generator gas analyzer is also piped to the gas manifold vent system. Identified in the PNID here are the critical valves that are adjusted to switch the analyzer from sampling from the generator case from the fan pressure and fan suction, switching over to your 
purge sample port, which is now sampling from the vent line and returning the gas to the vent downstream of a, a throttling valve. It's critical to properly configure the gas analyzer for purge operation to ensure accurate and conservative monitoring of the generator gas purity during the generator purge process. And as we touched on briefly, the generator, during the generator purge process, the gases are introduced and vented from the generator through the hydrogen distribution pipe or header and CO2 distribu distribution pipe or header. <coughs> Excuse me. As illustrated in the drawing here, these headers are physically located at the top of the generator and the bottom of the generator respectively. So hydrogen header is at the top of the generator and the CO2 header is at the bottom of the generator. We'll circle back to this critical point in a, in a short while later in the presentation. Now let's review some best practices for safe plant operation during the generator purge process. It's vital, vitally important to maintain an updated standard operating procedure and ensure the staff understand and follow it thoroughly. Ensuring that you have a current and accurate PNID of your hydrogen auxiliary system. Verifying that all the valves are properly labeled and agree with the PNID. It's important to verify that your hydrogen purity meter is calibrated and operating properly. And as we discussed just moments ago, it is properly connected to the vent and purge sample port. A portable gas analyzer is also recommended for the generator purge process. This enables a secondary source of measurement to ensure the most conservative gas measurement is used prior to changing your gases over. Operators should have a portable hydrogen sniffer with them to detect leaks. Also, uh, more simple liquid leak detectors such as Snoop or soap is also recommended. And that's critical because the valves that are actuated during the purge process typically haven't been actuated in well, maybe four, five, six years since the last time the generator was purged. So it's important to make sure we check those valves for leaks. Operators are recommended to carry personal LEL detectors anytime working in the hazardous area. It's also recommended to use non-sparking tools made of bronze or other non-sparking materials. The plant SOP should include verification that there's sufficient carbon dioxide available to purge all generators on site should there be a catastrophic event. It's recommended to have key signage in areas so operators know what is taking place in the area and which gas is in the generator. The next note refers to the spool piece we discussed, so a locked out air and hydrogen supply system so you can avoid the opportunity for hydrogen air to be mixed into the generator. As important with all processes, communication is key and it's recommended that the operations and INC team work together hand in hand throughout this process. This is an image of a portable gas analyzer that can be used uh, during the purge process as the secondary source of measurement. This is an example of a handheld hydrogen leak detector that can be used for detecting leaks in pipe joints, valves, or anything in the area where the hydrogen gas is present. This is an example of a personal LEL or lower explosive limit detector uh, recommended to be worn by all operators working in a hazardous area. Now that we've reviewed the best practices for conducting a generator purge, I'm going to walk through a representative generator purge process to demonstrate how one gas in the generator is replaced by another gas. <coughs> Thank you.
you'll note that this PNID is simplified somewhat from the PNID we've been using as the example. This is used to just illustrate the changeover of gases and demonstrate uh, what is taking place in the generator and the associated pipe work. We'll begin with an air test. Well, we'll make the assumption that we're coming out of an outage. And the first step in the process is to uh, ensure that the generator is, uh, is leak tight. So you'll see the air spool piece is installed. The valves have been configured for admitting air into the generator. And the green line indicates uh, the air supply being admitted to the generator. In this example, the air supply is being admitted through the CO2 header. Generator OEMs vary from OEM to OEM where the air supply is admitted and we've seen in either the CO2 header or the hydrogen header. Now the generator is past the air test. The next step in the process is to conduct the CO2 fill. In the example here, we'll use a red line to indicate the CO2 gas. The spool pieces have been uh, switched over and ready to supply a CO2 to the generator. So as the CO2 is making its way into the generator, it's important to note that our typical tap points that we'd be using during normal operation quickly detect the presence of CO2 in the generator long before the CO2 is fully pressed out all of the air out through the vent line. Again, CO2 is a much, much denser gas than air and being admitted into the bottom header pushes the air out the top header through the vent. That's why the purge gas connection is on the vent line to ensure that we're waiting for the gases to pass through the generator and be the most conservative point for ensuring a changeover of the generator before admitting the next gas. Now that the generator is full of CO2, we'll admit hydrogen to the generator. The three-way valves are adjusted to be prepared to fill hydrogen from the top header and vent the CO2 out the bottom header. Hydrogen is represented by the yellow line. And again, you'll see the hydrogen admitted into the top header and then slowly push out the CO2 through the bottom header. And even in this configuration, the normal sampling points will detect the presence of hydrogen before the generator is completely turned over as indicated by the final measurement here in the vent line. So once the generator is full of hydrogen, it's ready to go into operation. And then the analyzer sample ports are selected to be pulling from analyzer generator fan pressure and generator fan suction. Now in preparation to move into an outage, the generator would be taken to turning gear and we're prepared to fill with CO2. The valves are adjusted to vent the hydrogen out the top header and admit CO2 in the bottom header. And as it was when we were filling with CO2 at the beginning, the CO2 then pushes the hydrogen out the top header slowly. And again, our analyzer is now sampling from the vent line. And the last step in the process as we prepare for outage is to 
finish the purge with air. The removable spool pieces are swapped out, the valves are configured, and the air is admitted to the generator. And now we're fully back to air. Now let's discuss the aspects of what it would take to automate this process. So to automate a generator purge process, you need to install solenoids or actuated ball valves in key locations of your generator gas manifold. In the example PNID on the screen before you, The automation is being put in place to support an automated emergency degas and purge of the generator. So in this example, the hydrogen supply line, carbon dioxide supply line, and vent line have had solenoid valves introduced. So now let's walk through an example of how the system would work in the event of the emergency that's uh, demanding this system be put in place. So in the event of the emergency, whether it's a, a potential fire on the turbine deck or other safety concern, the first thing they're gonna wanna do is isolate the hydrogen supply system. Once the hydrogen supply system has been isolated, the vent valve will be opened and the vent valve implementation is tying the hydrogen header to the vent line, venting the hydrogen out from the generator. As the generator pressure is reducing, a case pressure transmitter is required to provide the feedback signal to the control system to monitor the point at which we need to maintain the generator pressure above to not result in an oil situation that's a seal oil problem that would result in seal oil spilling in the generator or having the gas in the generator leak out of the seal. OEMs typically have a prescribed pressure uh, boundary limit that they like to maintain. Once that pressure is achieved, the CO2 supply valve is opened and now your CO2 supply is fed directly into the CO2 header, flooding and blanketing the generator. For this safety situation, the vent valve would remain open and the CO2 would continue to flood uh, until the system is completely purged with CO2 gas. So on the next few slides, we'll review some of the important questions and considerations that need to be answered before installing an automated system an automated system such as this. The first question that comes to mind is how fast do we want to purge to take place? So the purge time. So the considerations for this would be what is the volume of your generator case? How much hydrogen do we have to vent uh, in total? And therefore requiring how much CO2 we need to bring into the generator uh, in the degas phase. The size of your piping, the number of valves, the number of bends and length of piping, all are factored into the purge time. The size of the existing pressure regulators, both on your hydrogen supply system and your CO2 supply system, become critical and most likely your limiting factors for the speed at which you can introduce those gases to the generator. When designing your, uh, your auto purge system, are you going to be focused on a blanket situation, uh, a more slow approach similar to a manual fill, or are you looking to be in an emergency situation or other situation that would require a rapid where we just want to flood and you're not concerned about how much hydrogen or CO2 you're consuming during that phase of the process? 
And then as we discussed uh, just on the slide previously, the seal oil differential pressure control, how quickly can you, your seal oil differential pressure valve make up changes in pressure in the generator? If you change pressure in the generator faster than that regulating valve can manage, you'll wind up in either a, a seal of, that leaks a breach of your gas in the generator overboard or potentially pumping oil into the belly of the generator. Neither situation is desirable. One situation we've run into, um, not so often here in, in North America, but uh, international markets, is uh, different purge gases are being employed. So in the North American markets, carbon dioxide is by far and away the most prevalent choice for the purge gas in the generator. In some other markets, nitrogen and argon gas are being utilized. So if you're in a market where nitrogen or argon gas is utilized, that affects the equipment and the speed at which potentially that those gases can be admitted to the generator. Specific to the carbon dioxide um, systems, if you don't currently have a CO2 vaporizer in your system and you're looking to speed up the process of flooding the generator, uh, the situation exists that if you're going too fast for the existing system, because of the nature of CO2, when it expands, the temperature drops and the risk of causing uh, dry ice formations or freezing and thermal shock. <clears throat> a CO2 vaporizer becomes an option uh, to increase the temperature of the CO2 gas to account for that expansion and prevent the freezing and thermal shock from occurring on that uh, rapid purge situation. The next factor is what type of controls will need to be in place. Uh, the first question here is related to where the control of the purge process will take place. Will it be programmed at the DCS? Uh, will you implement a third-party PLC somewhere in the system to automate and regulate that automated system? And another option would be to add the feature to an existing hydrogen skid or bring a new type of hydrogen skid in that includes an automation logic embedded in it. The difference between solenoid valves and actuated ball valves needs to be considered. Solenoid valves may be quicker acting, but may result in pressure drops that are you can't uh, live with in your in your pipe work. An actuated ball valve typically would be a slower acting system, but you may be able to achieve uh, a better flow characteristic. What criteria are you going to use to initiate the system? Uh, are you going to have interlocks in place such that a, a certain set of conditions need to be present already in the plant to enable uh, the automated system to kick in? Will it be fully automated and the DCS or whatever control system automatically initiates it? <clears throat> How much operator intervention do you want to include when developing that criteria? And then in the example we used, it was a, a simple vent and purge with CO2 for an emergency situation. Uh, another situation potentially would be you'd want to fully automate your system and include the hydrogen fill. And in doing so, uh, additional automation would be required up to and including determining how you'd manage uh, the installation of your and uh, managing of your spool pieces uh, from the safety perspective. Some other considerations. Uh, we talked about the purity analyzer and how normal mode is connected to the generator case and purge mode is connected to the vent line. If you're automating your degas or purging operation, currently the operators are manually selecting those valves potentially. How will you automate the analyzer to select the appropriate mode of, of measurement? And if you're using a multi-mode analyzer, how will you change the setting of that analyzer from normal mode to the purge mode? 
So that consideration needs to be uh, determined. We talked about the case pressure monitoring for when to admit CO2 to the generator. If you don't currently have case pressure transmitters, uh, they would need to be implemented into your system. We talked about the importance of maintaining your CO2 supply and the right levels. If you're automating your system, do you have to assess how much CO2 supplies on hand in the event an automation uh, is going to take over the introduction of CO2? And similarly for hydrogen. As a utility, uh, looking at the variations in your fleet, if you're going to implement an automated system across your fleet, different generators, OEMs, employ different hydrogen auxiliary system designs. If you want to have a common approach to an automated degas system, uh, making sure you fully understand the variability in your fleet so that you can implement uh, a design that meets your requirements from the stability perspective and training perspective for your personnel. When in a hydrogen environment, obviously we're worried about hazardous location requirements at all times when we talk about instrumentation and automation. We talked about the importance of an updated SOP and operating philosophy as you automate portions of that, ensuring that your philosophy is updated and properly trained and communicated to the staff. And lastly, uh, why are you putting the automation in? Is it for a very specific situation? And if so, uh, what type of, maybe the approach to the automation is different than if you're looking at it for a, um, an overarching uh, initiative for the fleet. So in summary, we've reviewed why hydrogen is an excellent cooling medium. We reviewed the safety concerns you need to be aware of when dealing with hydrogen gas. We reviewed the different elements of the hydrogen auxiliary system. We reviewed best practices for safe plant operation for a generator purge process and reviewed a process in detail. And we close by discussing requirements and considerations that need to be addressed when automating your degassing system. Remember, it's all about safe and reliable plant operation. Now for a little advertisement. If you found this webinar to be valuable, you may be interested in the Generator Auxiliary Systems Symposium mentioned by Kathy previously that E1 and Energy Tech Magazine are hosting later this year. Topics include uh, the systems that we just reviewed now, generator purge process. There'll be examples from personnel who perform rewinds and failure analyses. Failure modes of generators will be discussed. And uh, one of the, uh, the nice things that's being offered here is that attendees will earn continuing education credits uh, as well as part of their attendance. You can register directly at Energy Tech's website link, which is available on the slide set. And you can also contact us at E1 for more information. And we look forward to seeing you this summer in historic Saratoga Springs, New York. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Okay, thanks, Gus. We do have a few questions from our audience, so I will go ahead and start with some of those, if that's okay. Sounds good. Um, first question is, what is the function of the generator gas analyzer? Okay, so the generator gas analyzer's primary function is to monitor the generator gas purity, the, the hydrogen purity in the generator. Uh, during all modes of operation. Okay. Next question. To ignite H21 needs an ignition source. High temperature may be above AIG. How is this one can happen in generator? It's a good question. So um, in the generator, Obviously, um, we're making electricity. Uh, so in the process of making electricity, we're generating heat. That's the purpose of the hydrogen cooling gas is to remove that heat. 
in the event that there's a breakdown in the insulation in the generator, uh, one of two things can happen in that uh, environment. You can have uh, a local hotspot um, because of uh, an arcing or burning situation, and that itself could uh, achieve the ignition point of a, a hydrogen and, and air gas mixture. Another, another uh, example could be uh, you might have an arc over event uh, and that quick release of energy in the generator could be enough to uh, ignite a, a flammable mixture. So in and of itself in the generator, uh, we have the hotspot opportunity. A secondary thing we need to have is a flammable mixture of gas and the intent of the hydrogen purity analyzer is to avoid ever achieving uh, a situation in the generator where, where there is a flammable mixture of gas in the generator. Right. Is there a value in having fixed H2 LEL monitoring in lieu of handheld leak detectors? In certain areas of the plant, absolutely. Uh, one of the uh, properties of hydrogen that is helpful when it comes to leaks is that it dissipates very rapidly in ambient air environment, particularly in a power plant where there's a lot of circulating air. However, there are areas of the plant where you may have overhanging uh, structures where gases can accumulate, and those represent the opportunities where local LEL detectors are useful. And uh, the one example that comes to mind is uh, the plants that are running with combined cycle gas turbine plants, the collector cabinet is a fully closed environment for the most part. Uh, and those areas do represent uh, places for hydrogen to collect. And I have seen many LEL detectors installed in those uh, situations. Okay. Do you recommend a CO2 portable monitor in the work area when doing the CO2 fill and purge? Uh, CO2 concerns, because it's a pooling gas, uh, heavier and denser than air, suffocation and, and as asphyxiation is the concern. Uh, again, um, there's a lot of movement of air in the plant, but if there's a low port pit where work is being performed, they have to follow um, the uh, confined space entry permit requirements where oxygen monitoring is mandatory. So it's it's more important in this case to monitor your oxygen concentrations and follow the codes in the in the plant and in the jurisdiction you're in for for confined space entry what are the specifications for moisture content of the various gases used in the process so bottled gases uh, typically approach dew points of minus 70, which is exceptionally dry. Um, <clears throat> I personally don't know the specific specifications. I'm certain that if you contacted your local gas supplier, that information is readily available. Um, let's see. How about seals? How often do they need to be changed? Fields as in the rotor of the generator? Seals? F-I-E-L-D-S? Oh, seals. Oh, I apologize. Um, well, the, the seals of the generator the rotating seal itself has wipers and baffles that uh, represent wear items that need to be inspected on your major overhauls. Uh, obviously, if you have a situation where your hydrogen purity is declining and not able to be maintained, the first place to look would be your hydrogen seal. And during the overhaul, inspecting those, uh, those areas for pitting and wear. Um, and then based on your inspection, upgrading and, and improving that accordingly. Okay, is helium still more expensive than hydrogen? Much more expensive. Yeah, it's a 
we're not making any more helium on Earth today. So it's unless it's being made in a nuclear fusion reactor. So we uh, it is much more expensive than hydrogen. Is hydrogen gas expansion exothermic and could leak create enough heat to ignite? There is a there is a condition that uh, under very high pressures, leaking hydrogen gas can auto ignite. And I forget the very specific um, scientist's name who determined that. But uh, that question can be posed to me offline. There, uh, we've got a white paper that I can I can take an excerpt in and reply more directly with exactly the conditions that 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 could result in. Okay, we'll make sure you get the email address of the person asking that question so you can communicate directly on that one. Thank you. Um, let's see, what agency nationally recognized testing lab certifies the system and to what, it, what standards? So there are, there are several um, notified bodies for, I'm assuming we're talking about hazardous location certification with the, the topic we're reviewing today. So here in North America, uh, many agencies exist. There's uh, Intertech, Factory Mutual, UL, CSA. Uh, each of these notified bodies have the have jurisdictions over different uh, <clears throat> certifications and you, equipment is reviewed by their engineering teams and inspected and uh, they issue certi certifications accordingly based on the application of the products. Okay, and it looks like we have one more question. What is the estimated capital cost of an automated purge system? Well, that depends on the scope of the supply and answering several of the questions that we have uh, posed in the webinar. So. If uh, the gentleman or, or lady or gentleman who proposed that question have a particular um, situation that they, they'd like to discuss, be happy to take their information and work with them to uh, determine what their needs are and we can come up with a, a budgetary estimate based on that. Okay. And let's see, can nitrogen gas be used for the generator purging process rather than CO2? Uh, yes, that is, uh, it's one of the gases that we're finding is uh, being recommended in certain, in certain markets as the purge gas. The consideration when using nitrogen gas over CO2 is that the standard means by which you're monitoring hydrogen purity uh, typically can't differentiate between nitrogen and air. So when you're purging the generator uh, between the nitrogen and air phase, uh, you need to look at alternative methods to determine once the generator has fully um, uh, clean of either the nitrogen or the air, whichever direction you're moving, and typically uh, direct oxygen measurements are utilized uh, in that phase. Can the process be done off turning gear? Off turning gear, meaning the, the rotor stopped. Um, typically, uh, you need to have a seal in place. So I, I believe the answer is no, uh, that you need to at the minimum be on turning gear when you're performing the purge operation. And what frequency is recommended for portable instruments and H2 purity meters? So calibration frequencies vary from uh, manufacturer to manufacturer. And uh, at a minimum, uh, you'd want to calibrate that equipment on an annual basis. 
the nice thing about portable instrumentation is uh, the calibrations can be performed in uh, the lab or the maintenance shop offline <clears throat> without impacting the, the plant operations. So those are the recommendations, calibrate as frequently as you can so you're guaranteeing you're getting an accurate measurement when you're using them out in the field. Okay, now I'm not sure if I asked you this question or not. If I did, I apologize. What is the estimated capital cost of an automated purge system? Yeah, we had that one a few questions ago, Kath. That one is specific okay. to the, the plant and their uh, their specific needs. And we talked about there's a lot of variability in, in the generator OEM's uh, hydrogen auxiliary system. So that's best handled on a plant-by-plant, -plant, case by case basis. Okay, it looks like we have one more. I've seen both stainless steel and carbon steel. What is the preferred material for hydrogen piping? The preferred material is stainless steel. Uh, that's the most robust for hydrogen to ensure uh, safe and leak tight pipe systems. Okay, and our last question, how often should the generator purging SOP be reviewed and updated? Anytime changes are made uh, to the plant. So if you're installing new equipment, uh, review the SOP to make sure that uh, even the smallest change doesn't affect how the operators approach the use of the equipment in the, in the plant. All right, well, it looks like that's gonna take us to the top of the hour and we'll conclude today's webinar on generator degassing and purging with Gus Graham of E1. Uh, we've recorded today's webinar and we'll send everyone a link probably by tomorrow morning at the latest. And you'll have access to that recording for 30 days if you'd like to review the session. If you do have other questions that come up, you'll get a survey in your email and you can send us a question that way and we will make sure that Gus gets those questions directly. And we want to thank Gus and the staff at Environment One for putting together this presentation for us today. It was great and we will see everyone next time when we have a presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. Alrighty, goodbye.